Good morning, Mosaic. Good morning, Mosaic. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. We're going to start off with a video. Hope that you guys enjoy, and then we'll pick it up from there. Day. Happy Father's Day. It's funny. It's funny because there, there's a little bit of, of truth to that, right? Like, I, I don't know about you guys, but I see a lot of Mother's Day sales out there when Mother's Day comes around, Christmas. There's a lot of, you know, sales and things around that time. But Father's Day, I, maybe I'm just missing them or maybe they're giving us a break from having to buy stuff for another holiday. It could be that. But you never see that many sales or anything like that. Um, my mother-in-law works at a very large church uh, local to the Grand Rapids area. She told me that uh, the two most populated weeks or attended weeks at church uh, for them are Christmas and Easter. Third is Mother's Day. And usually last or close to last is Father's Day. And so I don't care what's going on in the world. I don't care what's going on in other churches. At Mosaic, we love Father's Day. Amen. We celebrate Father's Day. So, and we're going to celebrate it big today because that was a weak applause. So we're going to try it again. We're going to warm y'all up. It's going to be a lot of applause and fathers today. So at Mosaic Church, we love fathers, right? Amen. So if you are a father, if you are, and by father, I mean biological father, stepfather, adoptive father, a father figure where you are mentoring uh, young children, if you are any of those, can you please stand up so that we can give you a round of applause? We appreciate and love you guys. That's going to be your first one. We're going to do three of those throughout this sermon. So warm up, warm up your legs. We love Father's Day because fathers are important to God. God actually reveals himself as our father. So this is a relationship that he's created and that he's uh, identified himself with as it relates to us. Many of us, you know, grew up to believe that the first relationship on earth was between a husband and wife. And although that relationship is uh, bedrock to society, it's not the first. Because before Adam met Eve, he had already had a relationship with his father. And so to all the fathers in here, we honor you guys. We celebrate you guys. Um, I want you to know, uh, because I know many fathers kind of uh, go about their, their job and their role as just their responsibility. And it's what they have to do at home. But I want you to know that what you're doing is so much bigger than that. You are a reflection of God's love for us, to your children, to the community around you. And you are actually saving lives. You may not believe it, but I'll prove it to you before we get through the end of this message. So if you're new to Mosaic, one of the things that we do here is we ask questions. Obviously, you guys had those questions earlier where somebody said Chick-fil-A was overrated. I don't know where that came from. I don't know where that came from. Um, but, we, but we continue to dive into the questions so we have a chance to connect with our groups. So I'm going to ask you guys to jump into those circles one more time and hear are our second questions. What movie or TV dad was the best example of what a dad should be in real life? I actually meant to change that to who is your favorite TV dad? My bad, I didn't edit that for you, Alan. But who is your favorite TV dad and why? And then the second question is, what do you believe makes a great father? So we're going to take five minutes and then we'll come right back. <laughs> well, if, well, if you watch sitcoms, if you watch uh, a lot of TV, uh, you can be convinced that what it means to be a dad is to crack bad jokes. That wasn't a shot at Dan. <laughs> <laughs> to crack bad jokes. Um, you know, to get a bit out of shape, to walk around on eggshells around your wife and around your kids to make sure that you never upset anybody and to really just be out of touch with reality, right? Like that's generally speaking, your, your sitcom dad. And if we accept that as the real idea of what a dad is, 
versus just comedy on TV as major implications for our families, for our children, for society as a whole. Again, fathers are a, uh, a um, pivotal influence on the fabric of our society. When we have strong fathers that are living out fatherhood in a godly way, the impact on our society is extremely positive. But when that is not the case, or when they are absent, it has tremendous negative implications to it. And so God himself is our father, and he gives us an example of what it means to be a dad and how we should go about being a dad to our children. And so as dads, we should be reflecting our heavenly father. In the same way that our father loves us, we should be loving our children. So what does that look like? The first thing he does is he loves us. We love because he first loved us. Our children should know how to love because their fathers are teaching them that. They should be teaching them what it means to love, what it looks like to love, what the sacrifice of love is. Very important piece, and it's something that God has designed you dads to be able to do. Identity. If I ask about who the Baxter kids are, you guys will know who they are. Shout out to Bryce back in town. So happy to see Bryce back in the mitten. But you guys know the Baxter kids. Why? Because they're identified by their dad's last name, by now their parents' last name. The Strickland boys, we know who they are. The Mans, the Man kids, we know who they are. The Liggins kids are running around terrorizing everything. We know who they are because they're identified by their father's name. We should be giving our kids more of an identity than just our last names, though. Our Heavenly Father gives us an identity. He says that we're created in His image, that we're created for a purpose. We're created to glorify Him. Our children should know that they are created in the image of God, that they are unique and wonderfully made, created for a purpose. Guys, it's important. That's what it means to be a father. Purpose. Again, our Heavenly Father gives us purpose. We are created to glorify Him. It, we talked about, you know, in Genesis 1, multiple times that a statue, <clears throat> in the same way that a statue celebrates somebody, we're created to celebrate our Heavenly Father. If that's in our minds, if that's in, 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 ingrained in our children's minds, when they grow up, it will impact the decisions that they make. Who you believe <clears throat> yourself to be, who you, who's, what is it? I know who I am and whose I am, and it impacts all of my decisions. Your children have that same relationship with you. Who they are and whose they are will impact the decisions that they make. I think of, we got Coach Bracey in the house, Yamaka Bracey back in the house. <laughs> Coach Bracey is an amazing, amazing educator but she is also a track coach. What do you know that all of her kids are fast? <laughs> you think that's a coincidence? I think not, because I think when a kid realizes that I'm a bracy, oh, I'm gonna be lights out because that is just who we are. You give your children purpose and you can speak purpose into them. The words that we use to our children are, are super impactful, the same way that our Heavenly Father speaks life unto us, we need to speak life unto our children. Provision. Our Father takes care of us. We should be taking care of our children. Discipline. Our Heavenly Father disciplines us. We should be disciplining our children. It is not fatherly to let our children just run around acting crazy, doing whatever they want. That's not loving as a father. And, and although we may see that on TV and although we may see that on society, as men who are committed to following Christ, we have to be serious about discipline in our families and raising up our children in holiness, discipleship. Our kids should know the word because we're discipling them in the word. Our kids should know how to forgive because we're discipling them in forgiveness. Our kids should know how to love because we're discipling them in these things. And you think about, you think about, 
discipleship, right? And the goal of the disciples were to watch the teacher and to learn everything that the teacher did and to practice and be like the teacher. Our kids are already doing it. They're watching you, whether you like it or not. They're picking up your habits, whether you like it or not. I have some different laughs that I use. All of a sudden, I hear Isaiah using the same one. If you guys know me, when I laugh, I got a little cackle in it, right? <laughs> right? I do that. I'm like, yeah, man. I'm like, <laughs> Next thing I know, Isaiah's doing that. Where did he learn it from? It ain't Christie's laugh. He's getting it from his dad. What else is he picking up from me? What are our kids picking up? What are your kids picking up from you? And guys, if we're serious about that, and it will change our families, it will change our church, it will change our communities, and if all dads rallied around that, it would change our world. And so it's a, it's a huge deal. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, about one in four children in the United States, or 18.3 million children, live without a father in the home in 2022. This is a higher rate than other countries, with the U.S. having more than three times the global average of children, children living in single-parent households. And so God's created fathers with a specific task, with a specific anointing and giftedness to impact their families. And one out of four kids don't even have the person in the house at all. And you say, hey, but what's the big deal, right? You know, hey, single parent homes, you know, it's something that's been prevalent. You know, it's okay. And I, I want to, this is why I said earlier, we're going to celebrate you fathers because what you're doing in loving your children and engaging with your children, and again, I'm seeing this as a biological dad, as an adoptive, for adoptive dads, for stepdads, for mentors and coaches, these stats that I'm going to show you are all altered in a person's life because of your engagement with those children in a godly way. So, as it relates to mental health, this is a lot smaller than I thought it was. It was much bigger on my laptop when I, when I did it. It's much bigger on my laptop. When I, I think I might just have a big screen, but it's smaller up here. But I, I'll read some stats with you. Because think about this. We, we, have, we have a rise in fatherlessness in America right now. And again, the person that is supposed to give purpose and identity to their children isn't there, what do you know mental health issues are continuing to increase as well because we have a lot of kids that don't even know who they are or whose they are. Where did, what happened? Oh, he, he, he made it larger for it. Alan, you're the man. Shout out to Alan. I thought I clicked in this wrong. Some data suggests that six, this is from the U.S. Department of Justice. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes and 85% of children who exhibit behavior disorders are from fatherless homes. This is from Anderson, 2014. Overall data suggested children from single parent homes are twice as likely to suffer from mental health issues and behavioral problems as those living with married parents. Till 2016. Research also suggests that high risk children in single parent homes have nearly five times greater chance of developing mood disorders than those in dual parent households, even with, even with controlling for household income, age, and the depression status of parents. And then the last one from the National Center of Fathering. Some data also suggests that children without fathers are 10 times, 10 times more likely to abuse chemical substances and 71% of all children who abuse substances come from fatherless homes. Fathers matter. Being a great dad matters. You're not just doing a responsibility. You're not just doing a routine. You're saving lives. Education. Again, when you talk about the person that's supposed to be there to discipline, supposed to be there to disciple. What was the discipler? The teacher, right? The disciples called Jesus teacher, right? Because he was teaching them, teaching them how to live, teaching them how to engage. But what happens if that person isn't there at the home and now these kids are going to school 
If fathers are not engaged, children are twice as likely to drop out of school than children with both parents at home. National Responsible Fatherhood Clearinghouse. Here's a quote from Barack Obama in his 2008 speech. President Barack Obama stated that children who grow up without a father are nine times more likely to drop out of school. Back to the Department of Justice. Additional data shows that 71% of high school dropouts are from fatherless homes. North and West, 2001. Children with an actively engaged father perform much better in school. Some data shows that they are 33% less likely to repeat a class and 43% more likely to get A's in school. A study showed by the National Center of Education Statistics concluded that 10% of students living with both of their parents have ever repeated A grade, forgetting dropping out, ever even repeated a grade. There was actually another stat I, I didn't, uh, wasn't enough room, but school shootings usually linked to a lack of a father figure in that child's life. We know that education is the gateway into success. So when we're talking about some of the systemic issues that plague communities and the ability to afford different things and the ability to provide, education, although there, although there are wild systemic issues, one of the fastest ways to break that is through education. But if the dad's not there, if the dad's not engaged, education oftentimes falls by the wayside. And the last one I'll do, because there's, 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 I mean, there's, it's limitless, guys. I mean, you look at sexual activity and, and a lot of different arenas, all of these things are impacted by, by fathers. Criminal activity. On the whole, some data suggests that fatherless kids are 20 times more likely to be incarcerated. 71% of teachers in law enforcement state that the lack of parental supervision at home, major factor that contributes to violence in schools. Some data suggest that children without fathers in the home are 279% more likely to carry guns and deal drugs as children, as children, compared to their peers living with their fathers. And then the last one, of America's roughly 2 million prisoners, over 800,000 are parents and 92% of those are fathers. There are just about 2.7 million children that have a parent in prison. This isn't routine. And it's different than, than mothers because mothers at the whole have been picking up the baton and running with it as it relates to their children. We need the dads. We need the example of the dads that we have in this room. So again, what you guys are doing Maybe it just seems to you like, of course I'm going to do this. These are my kids. It's bigger than that. You're becoming an example to children. There's a lot of boys, little kids that are running around in this church that look up to you and have the idea of what a family should be because they're looking at you and you're impacting their lives. They're going to impact other lives. Again, part of the fabric of society and how it's woven together is, is off of fathers. So, I want you guys to know, you are not just doing your job, you are saving lives. And with that, I'm going to ask you guys to stand up one more time. All of the dads, we are going to celebrate you big because you are saving lives. And we have a gift for you. Because you're saving lives, we want to give you guys lifesavers. So Alejandro, can you pass one? to all of the dads in here, and let's give them a round of applause as Alejandro is passing these out. After you get one, you can sit down. <laughs> You're not going to tell our kids that they have them. No, 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 these are yours. Oh, yeah. Theirs are over there. Awesome, awesome. We appreciate you guys. Responsibilities of a father. So God gives us example 
of what a father should be, and there's certain responsibilities that we have in that role. It's a inexhausti- inexhaustible. It's it's a very long list. Um, <laughs> inexhaustive. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, I highlighted two things that I feel like capture the majority of it. First is to love and obey the Lord. Your first responsibility as a dad, your first responsibility um, as a husband is to love and obey the Lord. Follow in his footsteps. A big part of what we do is disciple and lead. You don't know how to lead if you're not operating from the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. You don't know how to love your children if you're not receiving love from the Father. And so it's super important that that comes first. And we're going to go over a few passages that speak a little bit to that. And then the second part of that would be to lead your children to love and obey the Lord. Oftentimes, we get caught in the rat race of believing it's our main job to make sure our kids get A's in school. I hope that all of our kids get A's in school. That would be great if all of our kids got A's in school. It's not number one. I know sometimes we feel like the best thing we can do for our kids is make sure that they know how to get along with everybody. Like as long as you can be friends with everybody, you'll be happy. Again, that'll be great if they could get along with everybody. It's not number one. There's some of us that feel like we just want our kids to be financially set up for when they leave the house. It is my job to get you to a point where you can get out of the house and then you don't have to come back because you're broke, right? Like that's the goal. If you got your kids set up financially, then we're great. It's great if your kids are set up nice. It's great if your kids got money in their account. That's not the number one goal. And then the big one. I just want my kids to be happy. How many times have you heard that? They just want their kids to be happy. It doesn't matter what their kids do. It doesn't matter what their kids behave like. It doesn't matter how their kids act. As long as their kids are happy and are friends with their parents, then you succeed it. And I would say that is almost completely wrong. Like, I'm not saying, like, completely removed from joy, but if, like, that's your, your goal, I would say there's... there's bigger things at stake. The best thing you could do for your child is to disciple them into a loving relationship with their Heavenly Father. Kids that obey the commands of love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself will figure out all of the rest of that. And you can help them to figure out the rest of that. But if there's if there's one thing that you that we should be leaving our children with is to love and obey the Lord. And so there's multiple passages of Scripture that speak to this. In the book of Deuteronomy, this is the last book of Noah, who wrote the first five books of the Bible. Moses, Noah. It's that joke, you know what I mean? It's that joke that the kids get you with, where it's like, yeah, how many many of each animal did Moses put on the ark? And they're like, two, and they're like, "Eh, it wasn't Moses, it was Noah. That's where I got that from. Anyway, you guys can use that this week. Moses, the last of the five written books by Moses. And this is right before Israel, who had been in the wilderness for years, are about to go into the promised land. And Moses is giving them major instruction from the Lord on what will lead to success in that area versus what will lead to futility. And picking it up, chapter 11, verse 18, he says, You shall therefore impress these words of mine on your heart and on your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your foreheads. He was like, the word of God you need to have around you at all times. You need to know it. You need to breathe it. You need to eat, sleep, love it all day, every day. It should be the thing that you know best. And then add to that, you shall teach them to your sons, talking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk around on the road and when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gate. He's saying you should be 
immersed in this all the times. And not only that, teach it to your kids. It is your responsibility to pass that to the next generation. It is your responsibility to set them up for success in the Lord. It is a responsibility and a gift that fathers have. And it impacts the rest of society so that your days and the days of your sons may be multiplied on the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens remain above the earth. Just just so you guys don't think that was just one random passage, we're going to go through a few of them because the Lord continues to come back to the same idea. Here's a passage in Proverbs from a father to his son who, who would have studied and have known the language and the teachings of Moses, not Noah, Moses. Hear, my son, and accept my words that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the ways of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered, and if you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction. That instruction is also in the word, in, in the Hebrew word, Torah. Keep hold of Torah. Keep hold of the word of God. Do not let go. Guard her for she is your life. She is your life. It will impact every facet of your life. Who you are, whose you are, what is your purpose? How do we love each other? When we look at the bigotry and racism of the world, Do you think it's immersed in those individuals' hearts, the word of God, to love your neighbor as yourself? Because I think not. When you look at any of, anything that is outraging to you today, anything that, that stirs you up, you're like, how could somebody actually be doing this? Do you think they wake up every morning and dive into the word of God and, and commit themselves to how can I best live for him? Because I think not. Because if we were doing that, a lot of the issues, not all because we're in a broken world, but a lot of the issues that we face today would be dissolved in a heartbeat. But it takes fathers leading their families the right way in this sort of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of evil. One more. This is um, from the Ten Commandments. So this is when Moses, not Noah, went up on the mountain and received instruction from the Lord to pass to the people, um, to the Hebrews at the time in the wilderness. And this is the second command. The first was to not have any God before him. And then second, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any of any likeness or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Your children's relationship with God could be severely impacted by your relationship with God. Think about that. How you love, serve, engage with the Father, your children are going to receive some impact of that. Are we diligent in that space? Are we committed to that space? Because I'm honored to say that I believe that a lot of the men here in this room are. And so I say again, it's not a little deal. It is an enormous deal what you are doing as a dad. It is an enormous deal what you are doing as an adoptive father, as a stepfather, as a mentor, as a coach. If you are leading and loving children in the Lord, you're saving the world. And so I know there's the, the kind of question out there. What if my child doesn't have a dad? You saying all these things are going to happen to them? 
I'll tell you this, I grew up in a household that was um, single mom because my parents had a divorce. So I'm speaking from experience of seeing what this sort of situation is like. One lie from Satan that my mom never allowed us to accept is that we didn't have a dad. First, we did have a dad. It's just a divorce. But second, bigger than that, always was that we have a heavenly father. And we knew that we had a heavenly father. And our trust was never on earthly individuals, not even our mom. Our trust from our parents was always to look to the king of kings and a lord of lords. So whoever feels like my child doesn't have a dad, don't accept that lie. Your child does have a dad. He's the greatest dad of all time. He's the original dad, and he loves your child more than anybody could ever love them. That's the first part. But the second part is, is a story that I'd like to point out in 2 Timothy. Because again, there are situations that pop up where um, there may not be a dad in the household. And I want to encourage the men in this room to step into the lives of those kids the same way that a man named Paul stepped into the life of Timothy. So Timothy is uh, one of the uh, evangelists and or pastors that traveled around with Paul. We have scripture that referenced the, the ministry of Timothy. He's like one of the Hall of Famers of the New Testament. Timothy's story is that his mom was a believer, his grandma was a believer, and his dad was not. And there's some external text to suggest his dad wasn't around. And so here's a guy that could have been single mom raised, but because of the faith and pointing of his mothers and grandmothers, he not only lived a life to honor the Lord in a tremendous way, he became an example to many across the rest of the world of what that looks like. Even at a young age, it's where we get the passage about don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. But there are all these things that you can accomplish because of your relationship with the Lord. But in Timothy, um, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, it says, To Timothy, my beloved son... Here is Paul being a mentor to Timothy, a father figure to Timothy, even if it's not biological, even if it's not adoptive, even if it's not step, you can still be a dad. And, and as men in a church, we have to take that seriously, guys. And we have to know that it's important to step into that role for the kids in our community. My beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Identity, love, purpose. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. Longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you which first dwelt in your grandmother. Lois, and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through, through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and discipline. God's done that for Timothy through Paul who was a father figure to him. So, for the last time, because I told you we're going to applaud three times, it's not routine. It's not just your responsibility. It is to change the world. It changes the fabric of family. It changes the fabric of society. And it changes the world when fathers live out their calling as the Lord has called them to. So, if you are a father, and by father I mean 
biological father, stepfather, adoptive father, a father figure. If you serve in a capacity that connects with children to provide for them, a person that hasn't stood up yet like Kyle Zooks, who provides for 60,000 children food each week in Grand Rapids. If you, are, if you are a man and you are serving your community in that capacity to love children, please stand up one more time, and this better be our best applause. So to the fathers, we love you. We're grateful for, we, for you. We thank God for you. And um, we hope that you all have an amazing Father's Day. Let's pray, and then we'll pass it back over to Aranda. Father, we thank you for your love and grace, your mercy, your kindness, your goodness. Lord, we're grateful that you are our Heavenly Father, that you love us, that you give us purpose, that you give us identity, that you disciple us in wisdom and in truth, Lord. Father, we pray for the honor, or we, we're grateful for the honor that it is to even attempt to be a reflection of your love for us, to children and our communities, Lord. I pray that none of the guys here will take that role for granted, and none of them will look at it as routine or mundane or not a big deal, Lord. It is an enormous deal. Father, I pray that you give them all Holy Spirit wisdom to engage, to connect, and to live out the calling that you've put on their lives, Lord. Father, I pray that anyone in here that has children in their lives, Lord, that do not have someone to step into that place, Lord, Father, that you would provide it, that they would be there, that you would raise up men to live in that capacity with those children, Lord. But Father, we're also grateful that stats don't matter when it comes to you. Amen. Although you have one design, Lord, that you've, that you've shown us, Father, we know that you are a way maker. And that even just from the faith of a mother, Father, you can still accomplish all the things that you've called those children to. And Father, there are some kids that don't have either. And I pray that you wrap your arms around them and all of us, Lord. To continue to lift us up to the calling that you've put on our lives, Father. I pray that as a people, we would love you with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. And Father, just one more thing, Lord, for the kids that popped up here as, a, as statistics. Lord, we see numbers, but you see names. You see hearts, you see souls, Father. I pray that as a community of believers, Lord, that we will reach them, that we would reach families, that we would reach them for, with the gospel, with your truth, Lord. Father, we lament people that are in difficult situations like this and pray that you use us to be the conduit and the gap. We're grateful for your love. We're grateful for your mercy. And we're thankful for fathers today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.